Welcome to Conversations with KMK Rider. And every week I talk with Vermonters who are leaders in the fields of government, healthcare, education, the arts, and community life. My guest is Phelan Fretz, who's, who's the executive director of the Echo Science Center and Aquarium at the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain. And this is a very special, special day for us because I welcome our listeners on 99.3 FM WVVT LP. Welcome, Phelan. Thank you very much, Kay. It's always great to be here. Uh, where is the Echo Center located? Sure, we're located in the Burlington Waterfront. You come rolling right down College Street, you can't miss us. We're at one College Street. <laughs> If you go in the lake, you've gone too far. If you go in the lake, yes, you go, go you know, you know, dry off your socks and come on back in. <laughs> uh, when is the Echo Center open? So we're open um, every day of the year except for Christmas Eve and um, Christmas. Um, so that's and 10 to 5 every day. You're open on New Year's Day. Yep. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. we are. What is your mission? So our mission is to educate and delight about the ecology, culture, history, and opportunities for stewardship in the Lake Champlain Basin. I'm talking with Phelan Fretz, the Executive Director of the Echo Aquarium and Science Center, and he's back again now. Uh, you, we have a very special exhibit on butter, live butterflies running through Labor Day, right? Yeah, we're really excited this year. Um, we started to work on this project a couple of years ago and found all the things we need. You know, how do you build a butterfly pavilion? What do they need to survive? How do we need to support them to survive as little creatures? Did all that work for the last couple of years, and so this year we're glad to roll it out. Well, it certainly sounds exciting to me. Um, this, this exhibit, uh, what, what, how do you walk into it, Phil? And what do you see when you walk into? We're starting to see the exhibit. Right. So, of course, you know it's 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 actually a butterfly pavilion inside of Echo. So, if you can imagine, in a space in Echo, there's a space that's oh about as big as this studio, um, lots of room in there, and you actually walk in through an airlock. Um, on both the entrance and exit because it's a USDA actually monitored facility because we have tropical species which are our non-natives. So as you walk in, all of a sudden you get this breath of air in your face and it's hot and it's humid and you're in butterfly world. Ah, well that, that is great fun. And uh, so if you get a cold day in the summer, cold <laughs> rainy day, God help us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually, you know, for all spring when it was chilly outside, folks were coming in and you could just get nice and warm. Um, and so we actually, with the help of uh, Gardener Supply, they actually provide all the plants inside the space. And so literally there's a garden path um, inside the space with plants that are up of tall as, as tall as you and I um, and a little path that wanders along. And inside that path, you'll see butterflies all over Oh, that's, that sounds just beautiful. Now, uh, how many species of butterflies are in the exhibit, and how, how many butterflies would we see flying around at one time, approximately? Right, so there's about 15 to 20 species, and actually we've got a sampling up here. These are all tropical species, things you would found in Florida, through Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, and here in the, in the Americas. Um, between here and all the way down to the bottom of South America. So these are species from all around those tropical zones. 15 to 20 species. In a, when you're in the space, probably about 150 um, different uh, butterflies in there. So it's very ah. full. Oh. You will have no trouble finding a butterfly there everywhere. Right, and when you approach the exhibit, can you see shadows of butterflies? Yeah, actually, the, the, you know, it's very well lit inside because we're trying to create a t tropical day. So it's very bright sun. Um, we've created with lighting. It's very warm um, and very humid. And, and when you walk up to the outside of it, you actually see their um, silhouettes, their um, shadows on the side of the outside of the pavilion. It's actually quite, an inch, quite a wonderful way to sort of get ready to go into the space. Now, I read that you have music playing. Yeah, we actually have some, we have some music and we have some tropical sounds. So it, it all helps you to sort of get the setting. You know, you're entering really a tropical environment. What does that mean? Um, and we try to, all of your senses, we try to bring you all into that space. So it's almost like you jumped on a plane and flew to Costa Rica or flew to the, to the tropical rainforest in Africa or to Southeast Asia like Malaysia. Try to take you to that space. Great. Now I'm talking with Phelan Fretz. He's a 
been a guest many times. He's the executive director of the uh, Echo Center on Lake Champlain. And uh, what colors are the butterflies? And why are butterfly colors so important? Can you point out a few to us here? Yeah, so the, these are many of the species that you'll find in the space, not all of them. I think one of, the, one of the ones that really is compelling for folks is the blue morphos. And the blue morpho, the, the fascinating thing about the blue morpho is all the other colors that you see here, they're mostly what we call pigment color. So in other words, the, the light reflects off of the color, so the pigment of your skin or the pigment of your, of your shirt. This is actually reflective. So when you turn this butterfly, if I pulled this out, and if we turn it different ways to the light, it actually, um, it actually it turns gray uh -huh. because it's not actually a blue butterfly. The, so the way the scales are designed, it actually reflects the blue light back to you. It's ah. a very special kind of how they designed it. So when you, if you bend it a certain way, and, you know, depending on the, we've got a lot of lights in here, so um, we may not get that spot, but you'll, it, it actually turns completely gray at some point oh. if you've got one uni, uni, unified source of, of light. So the blue morpho is for color is really important. Now, colors for butterflies, so why do they have colors? Um, they're actually, this is the adult, and so a butterfly's job is to find another butterfly, mate, and lay eggs for the next generation. That's really their job as an adult. Um, and the colors do a couple different things. They can be warning colors. So many of these, many of these butterflies, the, the caterpillar feeds on a toxic um, plant. And so it collects those toxins in its body as a caterpillar. And then as the, as the adult emerges, these all, most of the very colorful ones, they feed on vines and other plants that have a terrible taste to them. So if a butterfly, if a bird comes up and eats one of these, that'll be the last one it eats because it'll taste terrible. Mm. And so most of the bright colors you see are because of that. Or there could be ways that they're camouflaged. And one of the most amazing ones about the camouflage um, and if we can zoom in on this one. So on the front of the leaf wing, very bright colors, reflective blue in the middle and orange. And on the other side of this one, it looks exactly like a dead leaf. Look at that. That's just, amazing. Just a dead leaf. And so when it closes its wings up, as it usually does when it sits in it, it literally looks like just a leaf up in the, um, up in the trees. But when it opens its wings, you get the bright colors. So it's able to do this to signal maybe to a mate or other that, you know, here I am, but when it needs to hide, it can show us those leaves. So there's camouflage, there's warning colorations, um, lots of different ways. Sometimes the, the stripes on a butterfly um, when it flies are confusing to a predator. So you see this sort of striped thing going by. You can't tell where the front end is, where the back is, where the eye is. On some of them, there's actually an eye. Um, um, let's see, I don't think I've got, on the back of the bird wing, I don't think there's an eye underneath here. There's a lot of spots here that sometimes can be confusing to a predator. Where's the head? Where's the body? And that's part of the other ways you're trying to confuse that predator that might want to try to eat you. Well, it looks to me like maybe uh, some of these butterflies would just melt into the, into the background, too. Right, and so these are the malachites over here, named for their, sort of the, the color of that green gem. Um, you know, that, that color there between the brown and the green, you can imagine in a tropical setting, they just disappear. Or the, the rice paper um, butterflies from, from Malaysia, same kind of thing where they kind of disappear. And that, their, whole, their whole point is to hide until mm -hmm. they can try to find a mate and, and uh, lay the eggs. Yeah. So, we, so we have camouflage uh, of the butterfly and then we have itself, and we have the way the butterfly melts into the background, and we have the butterfly that doesn't taste good. Is yeah. this actually poisonous to, to a bird? Um, you know, it, it's not or really, it, it, it won't kill the predator, but it tastes really bad. Um, and that does the job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, who are the predators? So for, for these many different kinds of butterf um, animals, you know, everything from uh, in the tropics, you could have birds, you could have lizards, you could have small mammals. Um, you know, all those would be taking advantage of a butterfly. Um, and so that's why butterflies have really evolved into these extraordinary creatures to be able to evade predators, find a mate, you know, do the work they need to do to keep that cycle going um, so that the next generation can 
we can and, and one other one that I forgot to talk about was here's a, called a glass wing. Its strategy is to be clear. Ah. So the it actually disappears because the colors behind it show up. And you, it disappears because as it's flying, you just see this little sort of you can't really even see it go by because the wings are clear. So that's many amazing. different strategies. Now that's amazing. Now um are the male and female butterflies colored differently? Often they can be different. Um, these are Mormons over here. Um, in this case, the female is brighter, bright, bright, more brightly colored. The male is darker colored. Um, sometimes on the, on the bird wings, these two here, you'll get some different colors. Uh, you'll see many of these look very similar to the blue morpho. The males and females are the same. So it depends on the species. Um, and some of them actually will have what we call um, different gradations. In other words, in a particular species, you'll notice that these, more, these are all Mormons here. Um, this, these are both females. They have slightly different coloring, um, even though they're the same species. How do they name butterflies? Um, you have some interesting uh, <laughs> names there. Morphs and Mormons, I mean. Yeah, the, 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 the Mormon is actually, uh, it's a funny history because um, it really talks about, they, they actually live in large clusters and so um, when they first used to look at these, these think it was a, f a male with a lot of females. So you can see where the original name came from. Um, and so subsequently they figured out be because they have this changes in colors, they, can't, they, they finally had to figure out what the, real speed, what the real sex of each one of those was. And actually there's a balance of males and females. It wasn't a male with lots of females. <laughs> and the morph, where does that come well, from? And the morph is, morphine, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, the morph is sort of how, it cha how it would be different, you know, slightly different uh, colors. You know, we see this sometimes in uh, birds where their colors are slightly different from, from animal to animal. We see that in some of the butterflies, too. Hmm. So. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Talking with Phelan Fretz, the executive director of ECHO on Lake Champlain in Burlington. Um, why did you want to bring the butterfly exhibit to Burlington? What, what was the reason? Well, um, of course, at, at, at ECHO, we're always trying to help people think about their relationship to the environment and how can they be better stewards, whether it's Lake Champlain or your own backyard or somewhere where you travel to. And butterflies um, really represent an incredible diversity from across the planet. So it's really celebrating that, that, that the differences all around the planet, but at the same time delivering a message that these many times butterflies are a canary in the coal mine, so to mm -hmm. speak, about you know, how healthy is the environment? Um, um, what, you know, what, have, what impacts have we made as humans? And so we both have a, a uh, when you come to the butterfly exhibit, there's this extraordinary space and the beauty and the grandeur um, and the sheer intricacies of, the, of these animals. But there's also a message about nature has created incredible diversity and us as humans, we really need to protect that diversity and that's part of our message. Are butterflies endangered? Some are, actually. The species here, um, actually that we have here on the, um, that are all from the butterfly house, these of course died and then we pinned them. Um, these are actually all domestically raised. We actually purchase them from someone who raises them in the United States. So these are no way collected um, in, a, in a foreign country. So originally they went to the country, secured the adults, brought the adults, a few adults back to the United States, and then they've been cycling those adults where the adults lay, lay the eggs, and then they have host plants, and then they grow them up and produce the next generation. So the, this essentially stops people, well, helps to stop people from going out the, the famous net and catching them? Yeah, I mean, but, butterflies are not doing that well. Um, you know, the famed monarch butterfly um, is actually really struggling because of pesticides and the changes in habitat. Um, and so many of the butterflies in our environment, I would, you know, we really would suggest people not go out and collect butterflies simply because they are, their, their populations are in many ways endangered and threatened. Um, and so what we try to do is bring folks, you know, this has a good story because these are domestically captive bred. But when you go out into nature, you know, you are taking away from what nature has produced. Well, deforestation, loss of habitat. That's right, all that, because many of these species, especially tropical species, actually um, live in um, um, tall forests. And in fact, one of, the things when, one of the reasons why you select tropical species besides their beauty is that they actually fly very slowly, because they're from an environment that has um, dark, 
usually dark. It's the bottom of it, underneath a uh, canopy. Um, it's usually quieter. You know, there's not that much wind underneath there. So it's a species that can kind of flip their way around quietly. Um, and so that environment has both produced the incredible diversity, but also produces a, f a slower flyer, which is easier for people to watch inside the pavilion. Now, Phelan, uh, you've been the director of, of ECHO for several years now. You've never had a butterfly exhibit. Nope, this is our first one. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is, and actually in my career, I've been in museums for about 40 years and 15, last 15 years at ECHO. Um, and actually in two other jobs, I built butterfly houses. Oh. Um, so I'm sort of reaching back into that history um, and uh, reapplying it in our space once we figured out the details of how to do this properly. What is the life cycle of a butterfly? Sure. Typical so, butterfly. So, so these are all adults. Um, so these adults will lay eggs on a host plant. The caterpillar will hatch out. The, and, the, and the egg is usually the size of like almost a little bigger than the head of a pin. Mm -hmm. Not very big at all. Maybe as big as, you know, the, uh, as big as your earring. Uh, that would be a very big egg. Um, caterpillar hatches out, immediately goes to work and starts eating. And eats and eats and eats and eats and eats and eats and eats. And you've all seen these where literally it almost feels like you can watch them grow. Um, they start so tiny and grow to a large caterpillar. And it really is creating the foodstuffs inside its body, creating all those waxes and, and carbohydrates. And then they go into a, then that, that caterpillar, it covers its outside of its body with either a cocoon or a chrysalis. And then, this, then the real magic happens because inside that, it changes from a caterpillar to these. That's metamorphosis, changing from one to the next. And so, you know, a couple of weeks after it goes into that chrysalis, then out emerges an adult butterfly with those unbelievable wings. And the, when it first emerges, the, the wings are all crumpled up. And actually what it does is it pumps fluid from its abdomen into the wings. It stretches them out. And then they wait there, and the, and the wings harden with the air, they dry, and then they fly away. That's amazing. It's a, it's just, Have you seen this happen? Uh, you know, for me, the most amazing thing is I've watched the time lapse when they go into the chrysalis. And then um, if you look inside the chrysalis, it's just mush inside. <laughs> but this whole transformation happens, and then the back of that chrysalis will split open, and out comes the butterfly. It's well, that's, that's very amazing. interesting. They can't fly right away. No, they have to really sit and dry. Um, and make, make sure that those wings are stretched out. And if anything touches them early on, they might get, you know, that, that could affect that wing. And once in a while, you'll get one that, you know, the wing isn't right. And that's because as it emerged, something happened, and that wing could not stretch out and fill with the fluids and then, get, and then harden. Hmm. What is the life, so you, you talked yeah. about the life cycle of the butterfly. Now, what do butterflies eat? So these butterflies, um, they all have a thing called a proboscis, which is a, nose, very, a big nose. Yeah, it's a long, skinny tube that comes out of the front of their body, and they stick that down into a nectar source like a flower. And so at Echo, we basically have created these. We pick a, take a sponge, um, and so that they can land on the sponge, their little feet stay dry on top of the sponge, but they can put their proboscis down through and suck the, the nectar upside. So uh, basically, these survive on sugar as adults. Now, there are some species that only live a couple of days, like the atlas moth, that has no mouth parts. And so literally all the food from being a caterpillar turns into a moth, finds a mate, and it never eats anything as an adult. Hmm. So lots of strategies. Okay, now how butterflies obviously live different amounts of time. Uh, but we hear about butterflies who, who fly long, long distances. Now, do, does one butterfly do this? So, you know, you're talking about the monarch butterfly, right, which is an amazing right. butterfly. So actually what the monarch is, who it overwinters down in Mexico, up about 10,000 feet, where there's a, a balance between just cold enough so that their bodies slow down so they can overwinter, but not so cold that they freeze. That butterfly starts to head north, comes out of Mexico, maybe hits, hits the southern part of the United States, lays its first set of eggs. Those eggs grow to caterpillars, adults, a chrysalis, then an adult, and then that new adult heads further north. So, you know, they might first arrive in, in Texas in, in February. That first generation goes to April, goes to the Midwest, and then finally gets to Vermont in July. And then and in Vermont, they then produce, you know, another generation. But here's the amazing thing. The adult 
who leaves a place like Vermont, way north, flies all the way south hmm. as a tiny little being. That's it's amazing. Am it's amazing. They know where to go. Um, they've, they've, you know, they've done a lot of studies here, and they think it's the, uh, the Earth's magnetic shield. They are able to follow that ma magnetism and follow all the way down to originally where they came from. It's an extraordinary journey. Now, you'll notice that they do this when we get a, in the fall, when you get a, a cold north wind, you'll notice two things are flying south, butterflies and birds, because they're using that cold air and they're riding that wind south. And huh. you'll see butterflies catch that wind. If they catch a wind, let's say it's a 20 mile an hour wind, and that's running all day. Mm. They'll fly all day. They don't have to work, they just float they along. They just kind of float along, keep it going, and then they'll find this place where, and along the way, they'll look for nectar sources. Um, and not all of them make it, and, you know, and many of the ones that cycle are ones from the southern United States and keep going north um, because it's a long way to go south. But the monarch is the, one of the longest lived. Some of these here, I said the atlas moth, which you can see at Echo, um, lives a week. Many of these here live um, two or three weeks. Hmm. The average butterfly is a couple of weeks. So the monarch is sort of atypical. It's very atypical. Most of them do not. Uh, most butterflies really are in the cycle there. So most of the butterflies we have here, they go through that, that life cycle and they either overwinter as an adult, um, like a morning cloak hides in the, in the crevices of a, of a tree um, for the overwinter, or they overwinter as, a, as an egg hmm. and then reemerge the next year. Well, I'm talking with Phelan Froeks, the executive director of ECHO on Lake Champlain. Now, where would someone call to get more information about the butterflies and ECHO, and I know you have a great website. Yeah, so you can go to echovermont.org, uh, Vermont spelled out, um, and you'll, that'll tell you all about our butterfly exhibit, um, many of the butterflies that are in there. Of course, today you should always check out Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, we're putting out, we actually uh, provide a, a butterfly of the week oh. um, through Facebook and Twitter and all other forms, and so you can, we take each one of these butterflies and we talk about just it for the whole week. And you can also call us at 802-864-1848, and our front desk will be glad to help you out in any of your questions about um, the butterfly exhibit. Now, you see, we've been talking about butterflies are actually fragile. Uh, are there any special rules uh, for the butterfly exhibit? Well, you know, it, I'm glad you asked that, because when you come into the pavilion, um, it is, they are, you know, this is the space for the butterflies. And we ask you that you do not reach out and try to, hold or, or hold, uh, touch the butterfly, but let the butterfly come to you. And if you wear bright clothing, and sometimes some perfumes, literally they will land on your head or your shoulder. Um, we've had kids come in and they'll stand there. And if you, you think a child you know, can't stand still, tell them that a butterfly's gonna come land on his hand if he waits long enough. And I'll tell you, that young, young girl, grown boy, <laughs> they'll stand there for a long time waiting for that butterfly to show up. And many of them do. It's amazing how many times. And then, of course, we're all great photograph uh, photographers, right? So bring your mm -hmm. cell phone, take lots of pictures of, of your family with all these butterflies flying around them or landing it right on their head. Well, I have a funny story. I went to the uh, butterfly exhibit at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. Same idea, you know, the big yep. tent and everything. And I was in there just sort of wandering around, looking at everything. It was so beautiful. It was so nice. And, and people were quiet. That was another thing. People mm. were quiet. And all of a sudden, people were taking my photo. And I thought, hmm, why is this? And then one little girl said, you have four butterflies on your head. <laughs> and, and they yeah, were all right. different kinds of butterflies, wow. four different kinds of butterflies. And there they were. So, of course, I just stood there and was famous well, you know, for about five minutes or so. But right. it, was, it was amazing how they, I well, figured it, the hairspray maybe. It could have been the hairspray, you know, it's, they are. I they, had red on. And you had red, and then, you know, we often see like a butterfly land on someone with a red jacket, and you can see that proboscis, they're poking the jacket because they're trying to find where that nectar is. Right. You know, it's also interesting you said that people got quiet. Inside the space, it is amazing when you walk into the space, because it's, there's something very special about butterflies. You know, they're these wonderful sort of, they're, they're, they're kind, you know, they're, they're, they're safe, um, they're tiny, they're delicate, and people walk into our butterfly pavilion and it's very quiet in there. Oh. Subdued voices, um, there's something magical and special about being in that space. Yeah. Now, and now you said, you've written that 
that you do have magnifying glasses. Now, and how do you keep from uh, injuring the butterfly with a magnifying glass? Well, you know, the great thing about the magnifying glass, I almost brought one here today because once you hold it up here, and we've got some really big ones, that you can, if you hold it a good distance, you can actually see the tiny hairs on the abdomen or how the, what are, how is the antenna really created? Or if you look at the underside, sometimes you can see how the legs are attached. Or even some close, we've actually taken some of the wings and put them underneath our microscope and you can look at the scales on the wing. Um, so there's opportunities to take a really close up look at the, just what makes a butterfly a butterfly. Would it be a good opportunity to do that when the butterflies are sitting on someone? Yeah, that's one of the great ways. So in the, in the exhibit, of course, there's lots of plants. And so there's butterflies sitting on the plants everywhere. Right. Um, and, or that would land on somebody. And with these, you know, we've got lots of magnifying glasses. We actually hand them out to a lot of the younger ones as they're coming in. It gives them a, a chance to focus on, on creatures. And also there's a special skill about using a, a magnifying glass. It's a science skill. You know, you don't hold it like this. Mm -hmm. You hold it near the object and then it helps you see closer. So there's a, there's your, we're building science skills also. Which is what you want to do. That's right. So there's observation skills, science skills. Um, we actually, a lot of times kids come in and start counting butterflies. How many can you find a particular species? How are they feeding? Now, all those are questions that, you know, we can really help people think about and use their science skills. Well, well I feel and I hope you get a big crowd this summer, but why do, why do butterflies make us feel happy? You know, that is a good question. And we've been asking that. And you, you, you just recounted that you had a wonderful time when you were down in New York City. And um, when folks come to the, to the pavilion, there's just something magical about being in that space. And it's warm and it's wonderful. And there's these wonderful little creatures flying around you. Now, I will say, some, pe some people are actually a little frightened by it, hmm. which is surprising. Hmm. But something flying around you. You know, could, so, we, so we always counsel people to say, yes, you could have a child that, you know, might be a little frightened at sometimes too. Give them a chance to sort of take a look at the space. Maybe you have to come back again, mm -hmm. you know, as they learn about that the species won't hurt them. Yep. But most folks love the space. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to coming to the butterfly exhibit. I'm looking forward to hosting you. <laughs> thank you for joining us again, Phelan. And welcome to our radio audience. And thank you for coming. And thank you for joining us on Conversations with Kay.